will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to committee rule 2E and house rule uh, 11, the committee announces that she may postpone roll call votes. Pursuant to House Resolution 8, today the committee is meeting virtually. I want to announce a couple of reminders to the members about the conduct of this uh, remote meeting. First, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in a meeting. Members are responsible for their own microphones. And please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit to the record, please email them to committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the meeting. Pursuant to the committee, to, uh, pursuant to notice, the committee means to uh, consider the following measures. H.R. 2225, the National Science Foundation for the Future Act, and H.R. 3593, the Department of Energy Sciences for the Future Act. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's markup of H.R. 2225, the National Science Foundation for the Future Act, and H.R. 3593, the Department of Energy uh, Science for the Future Act. America has always been a driving force for innovation. And that innovation has been the most important engine of our economic growth for at least 100 years. However, our international competitors have taken note of our success. And those competitors are making huge bets on science and technology investments in the hopes that they will see the same fruits of innovation that we have seen. If we are to remain the world's leader in science and technology, we need to act now. But we shouldn't act rashly. Instead of trying to copy the efforts of our emerging competitors, we should be doubling down on the proven innovation engines we have at the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. The bills before us today do just that. The race to be the best at science and technology is a race to have good high paying jobs. And I want to be clear, I'm not just talking about scientists and computer programmers. I'm also talking about the electricians and pipe fitters who have to build our research and computing centers. I'm talking about the technicians and custodial staff that help maintain these facilities. I'm talking about the factory workers manufacturing the next generation of green technologies right here in America. That's what is at stake when we consider these bills today. The first bill we will be considering today is NSF for the Future Act. It is the first comprehensive reauthorization of NSF in more than 10 years. The legislation puts NSF on a sustainable five-year doubling path. It strategically builds an NSF existing strength on NSF existing strengths while also pushing the agency in bold new directions. It represents a significant step forward in building more regional and institutional diversity in our academic research enterprise. And it addresses our STEM pipeline at all levels. I'm very proud of where this bill is today. It includes many good ideas from members on both sides of the aisle. It also reflects input from the most diverse group of stakeholders this committee has ever consulted. We have dozens of letters of support from organizations representing all fields of science and engineering. Thousands of individual scientists have publicly voiced their support. Countless Thought leaders, universities, and former government leaders have told us how much they support this bill. This is reflected in the strongly worded endorsements we have received from groups like the Association of American Universities and the, Amer and, and the American Chemical Society. We will also consider the DOE Science for the Future Act. The Department of Energy's Office of Science is the nation's premier federal agency 
that supports research in the physical sciences for energy applications. And the bill we are considering today will ensure that the Office of Science remains the world leader in these pursuits for years to come. Consideration of this bill could not come at a more critical juncture as the world forges a clean energy future so that America can reap the rewards of that transition. This bipartisan bill would be the first comprehensive authorization for this crucial office that supports over half of DOE's non-defense R&D budget. H.R. 3593 authorizes significant, steady, and sustainable growth for the Office of Science. The bill ensures that the office's construction projects and upgrades to its user facilities have the resources they need to be completed on time and on budget. That's why the bill has been endorsed by stakeholders in the business community like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the academic community like the University of Texas, and the scientific community like the American Physical Society. Without objection, I'll place into the record the full list of endorsing organizations for both bills. The bills before us today are the result of a collaborative bipartisan approach. Before I yield back, I want to recognize the efforts of Ranking Member Lucas and his staff in helping us to get where we are today. I feel strongly that the legislation we are considering today represents the best of this committee. And it would not have been possible without the strong collaboration by Rankin Member Lucas. I look forward to a productive markup and to getting these bills to the floor so we can send them to the Senate. I now recognize our Rankin Member, Mr. Lucas, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for holding today's markup of the NSF for the Future Act and the DOE Science for the Future Act. These comprehensive reauthorization bills of the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy Office of Science are the accumulation of years of work by this committee to consider the best path forward for two of the most important pieces of America's federal research enterprise. America's scientific and technological competitiveness has been our highest priority. I should say ours and my highest priority as ranking member of this committee. It's gratifying to see that there's now momentum on both sides of the aisle in the House and the Senate for legislation to secure our global scientific and technological leadership. The need to act now to redouble our research investment is best captured by two data points. First, as much as 85% of America's long-term economic growth is due to advances in science and technology. There's a direct connection between investment in research and development and job growth here at home. Second, China increased public R&D by 56% between 2011 and 2016, but the U.S. investment in the same period fell by 12% in absolute terms. China has likely surpassed the U.S. in total R&D spending, and though through both investment and theft, is working to overtake us as the global leader in science and technology. Our international competitiveness is at stake. America's continued scientific leadership requires a comprehensive and strategic approach to research and development that provides long-term increased investment and stability across the research ecosystem. It also requires interagency collaboration and public-private partnerships. And it must focus on evolving technologies that are crucial to our national and economic security, like AI, semiconductors, quantum sciences, I believe we have achieved that with these two bills. In the NSF for the Future Act, we put a great deal of care into crafting a new directorate that provides NSF's ability, improves it might be the best way to describe, their ability to advance fundamental research without duplicating or seeking to replace the missions of other federal research agencies. Our proposed directorate for science and engineering solutions takes the basic research funded by NSF and helps apply those discoveries to solve national challenges from cybersecurity to climate challenge change. We also propose a funding profile for the new directorate that is practical, sustainable, 
and in balance with the rest of the foundation. Although most of the public attention has been on the new directorate, our bill also provides updated policy direction to the rest of the foundation. It has been four years since NSF received a comprehensive policy update and 11 years since the last reauthorization. So these provisions are important. I will share a few highlights of the bill. NSF is the largest federal funder of STEM education and our bill directs new mechanisms to improve the foundation's investment at STEM at all levels. The bill also includes provisions to improve the availability of research data, to more rapidly advance innovation, and to improve transparency and reproducibility of taxpayer-funded research. Additionally, the bill includes important measures to protect American research from foreign influence and theft. These policies were developed after months of input from stakeholders and bipartisan discussions. It's smart legislation, and I'll discuss some other provisions in the bill when we consider the bipartisan amendment in the nature of a substitute. Next, we'll consider the DOE Science for the Future Act. This bill reauthorizes the Office of Science to increase our investments and provide a roadmap for DOE's research and development work. If it becomes law, it will be the first comprehensive authorization of the Office of Science, and it could not come at a better time. The bill provides nearly 50 billion dollars over five years, giving the Office of Science and our national labs the resources they need to continue to excel. We need cutting-edge facilities for our federal scientists and researchers from academia and industry to conduct big science, research that can't be done in individual labs and requires massive equipment that industry cannot provide, like advanced light sources and neutron sources. Our nation's national laboratories, hosted by DOE's Office of Science, are experts in conducting this type of complex, large-scale research. Our bill authorizes funding timelines for DOE research facilities and equipment that will bring them online as quickly as possible and at the lowest possible project cost. I'll discuss more provisions of this bill when we consider the bipartisan amendment in the nature of a substitute. Chairwoman Johnson and I have taken a deliberative and bipartisan approach to revitalizing American research. Together, the NSF for the Future Act and the DOE Science for the Future Act are a sustainable strategy for American progress. It comprehensively scales up our research enterprise. Today, we'll consider many amendments that I think will improve these bills. I hope that through the process, we can maintain the bipartisan spirit that created these two groundbreaking pieces of legislation. Thank you, Chairwoman, for your partnership in this process. Your leadership should serve as a model for all of how the committee legislative process should work. And I say that with the greatest of sincerity. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucas. We will now consider H.R. 2225, the National Science Foundation for the Future Act, and the clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2225, the National Science Foundation for the Future Act. Without, without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Does anyone wish to be recognized to speak on the underlying bill? Mr. Posey. Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Johnson. And, and I want to echo the uh, ranking member's comments about the uh, truly great job that you've done uh, bringing the bill uh, forth so far. And, and, and I just I want to point out that this bill will directly compete with NASA's budget when it comes to appropriating funds uh, because they're both funded out of the same pot of money, the same commerce, justice, uh, science appropriations, uh, line out. Uh, the authorizing amount of funds has increased tremendously with this bill and will force the appropriations committee uh, to fund it. I'm concerned that some of the funds may come from NASA's budget. Uh, uh, there have been past amendments 
on the House floor cutting NASA's budget and sending funds to uh, National Science Foundation and other places. So just like to make that clear, Madam Chairman. And I thank you again for the great job you've done. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, we will proceed now with the amendments in the order on the roster. The, the first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by myself and the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one, amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. I ask unanimous consent to dispense of the reading and without objection, so ordered. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes to explain the amendment. I am pleased to offer uh, this amendment in the nature of the substitute for the National Science Foundation for the Future Act, along with Ranking Member Lucas. I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for their thoughtful engagement and enthusiastic support for the strengthening of the National Science Foundation through this process. We have a lot of amendments today. So in the interest of time, uh, I'll insert my full statement in the record at this point, and I urge all my colleagues to support the amendment. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Madam Chair. Yes. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. This amendment strikes and replaces the text of H.R. 2225, the NSF for the Future Act, to incorporate stakeholder feedback on the underlying bill, add bipartisan member priorities, and make technical changes to the text. I'd like to thank the Chairwoman and her staff for working with us to get these changes finalized. As I said in my opening statement, this legislation is a result of more than two years of tireless bipartisan staff work, and this amendment is a continuation of that process. I'm grateful to the members of this committee for their engagement in the process for further improving the bill and to the chairwoman for agreeing to incorporate Republican priorities. Such priorities include a provision by Representative Babin to, to launch a secure computing enclaves program to ensure that the protection of federally funded research conducted at universities. It also includes a bipartisan provision by Representatives Ross and Baird to establish technology research institutions at universities focused on key technology areas, and another to encourage the development of unmanned aerial vehicle technologies by Representative Anthony Gonzalez. This amendment also includes several new STEM education provisions, a priority for members on both sides of the aisle. It includes Representative Kim's provision to encourage informal STEM learning by supporting student participation in nonprofit competitions, out of school activities, and field experiences related to STEM subjects. And as artificial intelligence continues to drive the future of technology, manufacturing, and services, this amendment recognizes that we will need a workforce of skilled researchers and practitioners to support that growth. This amendment includes a provision by Representative Obernerty and Representative McNary Nerney to establish tra traineeship and fellowship programs for graduate and postdoc students who pursue artificial intelligence related research. As we redouble our research investment in NSF, it is also critical that we do more to ensure STEM opportunities reach more Americans. We need to make sure investment doesn't just happen on the coast or at the top, top 10 universities, but also at places like Stillwater, Oklahoma, and land-grant institutions like Oklahoma State, or historically black colleges and universities like Langston University. The capacity building for developing universities provisions supports administrative capacity building activities at minority-serving institutions to increase their expertise and ability to compete for and manage foundation research and development awards. In addition, the Fostering STEM Research Diversity and Capacity Program will support research capacity building for research institutions outside of the top 100 federally funded institutions. This includes developing and expanding research programs, faculty professional development support, support for students to conduct hands-on research, the acquisition of research instrumentation, and much-needed administrative research support. 
I am grateful to Chairwoman Johnson for working with me to develop these complementary and important provisions that further the goal of providing quality access to STEM opportunities to all Americans, regardless of your zip code. As always, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work alongside my science committee colleagues to prioritize fundamental research that will support U.S. innovation and keep our country safe, independent, and globally competitive. The NSF for the Future Act is a product we should all be proud of, and today's amendment brings us one step closer to its enactment. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Ms. Bonamici wants to be recognized. Yeah. Bonamici. Madam Chair, are there any other comments? Yes, Madam Chair, I do seek recognition. Yes, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you so much. I uh, move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word, Chairman Woman Johnson. The member is recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Johnson, for your leadership. The National Science Foundation plays a key role in our nation's research enterprise. It's the only federal agency tasked with supporting fundamental research across all scientific disciplines. Over the course of more than 70 years, the NSF has funded research and education activities at more than 1,800 universities, colleges, and other public and private institutions. But despite the agency's expansive mission and role in our nation's research ecosystem, flat funding has often limited its contributions. Today, we have the opportunity to strengthen the work of the NSF to address the next moonshot challenge by advancing the first comprehensive reauthorization of the NSF in more than a decade. I'm grateful to Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for their collaborative and thoughtful approach in crafting this bipartisan legislation, and I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of this bill. This is a critical time to be scaling up investment, investments in fundamental research. The NSF provides approximately 25% of the federal support for basic research conducted at academic institutions. For example, with the support of the NSF, Oregon State University, a land-grant university, will operate a regional class research vehicle. The name of the vessel, TANI, comes from a select term meaning offshore, and the vessel will be equipped to conduct detailed seafloor mapping. The TANI will help identify geologic structures important in predicting the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake that could likely trigger tsunami on the West Coast. As this committee works to increase funding for the NSF, I hope the agency can continue to build on this work and support further investments in ocean observations. NSF-funded research is also important in our efforts to solve the climate crisis. Last month, the House passed my Bipartisan Coast Research Act, which reauthorized NSF-supported ocean and coastal acidification research. There's tremendous untapped potential for NSF research to help advance comprehensive science-based climate policy. Throughout my years on this committee, I've heard some concerns from tribal nations and entities about their exclusion from many climate science funding opportunities across the federal research enterprise, including those at the NSF. I appreciate Chairwoman Johnson's partnership in including report language as this bill advances, explicitly encouraging partnerships with tribes to receive NSF funding for collaborative research opportunities. Also, as a member of the Education and Labor Committee and founder of the co and co-chair of the Congressional STEAM Caucus, I continue to advocate for the integration of art and design into STEM fields. STEAM education inspires creative, critical thinking. And it can build more inclusive classroom environments that support greater diversity of students interested in STEM, especially girls and people of color. Our committee's work today is also an important step to address the underrepresentation of women and people of color in STEM fields by better aligning STEM education with training and needs of our nation's workforce. I again want to thank Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for their leadership. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of the substitute, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, and thank you for holding today's full committee markup of the NSF for the Future Act. I'm proud of the process this committee has undertaken to get here today. Uh, this bill includes long-term planning to make sure strategic and sustainable investments in the STEM workforce, uh, to expand and enhance America's talent pipeline, it supports the construction and maintenance of world-class facilities. It promotes the research needed 
to develop revolutionary technologies that are crucial to our national security and our economic security. Um, as, as I've said before, and, and I just want to state again for the record, that making these investments are important, but we must also secure them. Uh, we must secure taxpayer-funded research and technologies from our adversaries, like the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, currently, the NSF funds approximately 12,000 annual awards to more than 40,000 recipients. And through the investments that this bill proposes, these numbers are anticipated to nearly double. Uh, with that growth comes a greater need for resources to protect our research. Uh, we need authorities and tools for NSF, uh, for the foundation, for sponsoring institutions, and for applicants to identify and to address malign foreign influence and research theft. I want to thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, Chairwoman Stevens, for working with me and my team uh, during our subcommittee markup and adding my amendment to ensure NSF has those resources and authorities they need to further investigate and act upon the nearly 1,000% increase in malign influence and research theft that the NSF IG is reporting. Uh, this bill instructs the director to develop the required online security training modules to ensure that individual researchers understand what makes an appropriate foreign partnership and domestic partnership uh, and the importance of accurate disclosures. Uh, and it sets a baseline for what's right and wrong. Uh, it's critical that we cr strike the correct balance between keeping this research enterprise open as it has always been, but also protecting it. There is more work to be done, however, including adopting the amendment that Representative Fenstra and I are offering today to prohibit grant applicants from participating in malign foreign talent programs. I think these provisions take some big steps in striking that balance. I also want to thank the university systems for working with us on the training module and the training and that policy uh, that requires institutions to certify compliance. Look, with the CCP threatening to leapfrog America technologically, we are at an inflection point that's critical for the U.S. to scale up this enterprise. Uh, but it does also include the need for more R&D security of our domestic supply chain of critical minerals. China currently has a stranglehold on the supply and processing technology of these resources and it endangers our ability to produce critical end products. Thank you again, Chairwoman, for including the provision for my uh, America Critical Mineral Independence Act of 2021 in this amendment. This provision supports basic research grants to advance critical minerals, uh, to advance critical mineral mining strategies and technologies to better utilize existing domestic resources. We need to bring this supply chain back home to America, and this provision is an important part of achieving that goal. Lastly, I would like to thank Representative Ross, Ranking Member Lucas, Chairwoman Johnson for co-sponsoring the National Science and Technology Strategy Act of 2021, uh, which we introduced on Friday. We consider these two bill, as we consider these two bills today, that would double down on our investments in science and technology. It's critical that we have a whole of government strategic approach to develop U.S. research and innovation goals. And by requiring a national s and strategy to be set every four years, this legislation will help the United States establish priorities to maintain, to remain competitive on a global scale and stay a leader in cross-cutting innovation. I look forward to working with the chairwoman on moving this bill through committee, through our committee in the future. But there is momentum on both sides of the aisle to make the needed investments to scale up the U.S. research enterprise but it must be done in a realistic and pragmatic and sustainable way. I believe this legislation does that. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of this legislation with Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and Chairwoman Stevens. I wanna thank them and their staff for working uh, together with mine to develop such a strong piece of legislation. And I encourage members to support this amendment and support the full bill on final passage. I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens. Madam Chair, I, I move to strike the last word. You recognize the five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, not only for your remarkable leadership, but also for convening today's full committee markup. This has certainly been a remarkable process that has brought us 
to today's markup. Um, last month, I was honored to move the National Science Foundation for the Future Act uh, through the subcommittee. Uh, markup is the chairwoman of the subcommittee on research and technology alongside ranking member uh, Waltz. Uh, we passed uh, this bill with uh, through our subcommittee with uh, incredible and overwhelming bipartisan support by voice vote. Uh, we also wanna recognize uh, Dalia Sokolov and Sarah Barber from the committee staff for a lot of their tireless work on this bill and helping to move things along. And today we take another step forward and mark up the National Science Foundation for the Future Act as a full committee to build on the R&D infrastructure the National Science Foundation needs to seize the promise of America's innovation future. We have been through a challenging period where over the last decade, we have seen a significant underinvestment in research from our federal government, all while the global landscape of competition in science fields drastically shifted and exploded with opportunity. For instance, currently, the National Science Foundation is only able to fund less than a quarter of the grant proposals submitted and three billion of the top rated grant applications are ultimately declined. Through three committee hearings this year alone, we have heard from stakeholders in academia, the private sector and innovation policy experts that the National Science Foundation is an essential asset that flat budgets have squeezed for too long. The National Science Foundation plays a pivotal role in our research ecosystem. As the only federal agency charged with supporting federal and fundamental research across all scientific disciplines, we are at a moment where we will say we are no longer going to un undermine and diminish this function. Therefore, this bill the National Science Foundation for the Future Act, Madam Chair, that you have helped to champion alongside Ranking Member Lucas, doubles the budget of the NSF over five years in order to meet the needs of our country's global leadership in innovation. But that, it, but that increasing of the budget is not enough. The NSF for the Future Act creates a partnership-driven, solutions-oriented technology directorate to accelerate use-inspired and translational research within the United States. We are capturing our return on spend. The bill also proposes scaling up our pre-K through 12 STEM education, research innovations, and modernizing undergraduate and graduate student training to making research data more accessible, funding more research enabling infrastructure and expanding opportunities to participate in NSF funded projects. We are talking about the equity agenda. I am hopeful that we will take another major step forward and pass the bill out of committee today. As members of the science committee, we are certainly no strangers to working together to get the job done and to get it done right away. So often, this committee serves as a model committee of effective congressional bipartisanship and proves that so much good work can be done for the American people. Working on the NSF for the Future Act has been a collaborative process. In our discussions, the stakeholder community and, my, and our congressional colleagues have re remained committed to the shared goal of positioning the United States to continue to lead the world with our ideas, our inventions, and most certainly our people. We are a nation founded on ideas and by people who know how to innovate. Innovation is in our bones as Americans and striving for a better way or a more perfect way forward as it is in our creed. I look forward to today's continuing discussions on the best way forward with this bill to achieve our shared goal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Babin. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much, Madam Chair. First, I want to commend the excellent bipartisan effort that we've seen in crafting these bills. Uh, sadly, it's rare to see true bipartisanship work these in the House. Uh, the 19-hour transportation and infrastructure highway bill markup last week serves as an example of the unfortunate realities of partisan closed-door work. 
And I'm very happy to say that this bill is a very good example of uh, how the House is supposed to work in crafting legislation. Uh, to that, I'm very pleased to see that my bill, which in, uh, secures and protects our university's technologies, and is included in this bill. If we are going to offending to invest in our science and technology, we must make sure that it is protected. The FBI and intelligence agencies have continually warned Congress about the threat of foreign espionage of U.S. science and technology, and particularly on university campuses. China's investment in development and not on basic research implies that they are building their technological success on the basic research developed here in the United States and also around the world of our allies. We have even seen the infiltration of Chinese influence in our university systems on several different occasions at our top institutions. We must work to ensure that foreign nationals from China coming to study at our universities do not undermine our open system of research. And that is why I introduced H.R. 3747, which will provide a pilot project for a nationwide network of secure computing enclaves for federally funded research and universities. I am delighted to see that this bill is included here today and that we can help provide our research institutes with the resources necessary to mitigate these threats by securing our own networks. And I again thank you, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for the excellent bipartisan work. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. McNerney. Well, I thank the chairman for recognizing me. And I, I want to thank you personally for your hard work, uh, Chairwoman Johnson, uh, and your leadership on this issue and the, the Democratic staff. I also want to uh, give a, a shout out to Frank Lucas, uh, uh, the ranking member for your hard work, Frank. It's always good to hear that you're uh, involved in this and the staffs on both sides. Say, you know, the United States has been the leader uh, in tech and science for generations. Uh, we take it for granted. Uh, we can't even imagine what it would be like if, if we weren't the leaders. And uh, if we didn't pass this bill, then we might just find ourselves in that position. So uh, this is a critically important uh, piece of legislation. It'll keep us in the game and, and put us on top. Uh, and because of that, I, I am strongly supporting of this. Uh, and it's great to see uh, a bipartisan effort here. And this is truly a bipartisan effort. Uh, and we all uh, tend to agree that uh, we want the United States to have a strong uh, science uh, leadership role in the world today. I'm also pleased that several pieces of legislation that I've worked hard on are included in this uh, AINS and uh, including this one that is being discussed now. Uh, this is important because the several of the United States uh, universities are really leaders in the world. Uh, and I don't want to name them, uh, but uh, I'll point out Stanford since that's near my, my uh, home. Uh, and um, there's qualities that, that, that these uh, institutions have that uh, we want to identify. Uh, we want to make sure we understand what makes these uh, institutions so powerful and help uh, use that information to empower many uh, other institutions around the country to become uh, thought leaders and science leaders. So that's what this particular uh, amendment is about. I'm very proud to support it. Again, I appreciate uh, the work that's gone into it from, from both sides of the aisle. And I'll uh, urge my colleagues to show their strong support and brag about it too. So uh, with that, I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Beer. I wanna thank you, uh, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for holding today's markup. And I also thank you for offering this amendment in the nature of a substitute, which I support. This amendment includes a number of productive provisions, including one that includes bipartisan legislation Representative Ross and I introduced last week to establish technology research institutes at research universities as part of the New Science and Engineering Solutions Directorate. These institutes will support critical research in key technology areas to solve some of the greatest challenges, including challenges with social, economic, health, scientific, and national security implications. These institutes will also promote public-private partnerships for key technologies and the creation of multi-user research test beds and instrumentation. Another key role of these institutes will be to establish traineeship 
and programs for graduate students pursuing a master's or a doctorate degree in areas related to critical technologies for hands-on research experiences in government and the industry. American superiority in science and technology is foundational to our economic competitiveness, our national security, and our way of life. This provision, this amendment, and this bill provides a responsible and sustainable future for our National Science Foundation. The investments they make in basic research, which are really the seeds of innovation, will ensure America's future competitiveness. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the NSF for the Future Act and support this amendment. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment and this bill during the final passage. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, Chairwoman Stevens, and Ranking Member Waltz for their leadership on this bill. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross. Ms. Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. I also am um, speaking in favor of this um, amendment and all of the wonderful bipartisan work that this committee and the subcommittee did. Um, I tell my district all the time, don't believe what you see on TV. The Science, Space and Technology Committee is setting an example for the country. These bills will play a vital role in furthering our national research enterprise, which is a priority for my district, which includes much of the Research Triangle Park. The bills will enhance our research enterprise by funding researchers, expanding STEM education initiatives, broadening participation in STEM by underrepresented groups, updating research and infrastructure, and even more. In 2020, NC State Land Grant Institution in my district was one of the country's leading research institutes, institutions and was awarded nearly $53 million in grants from NSF for cutting edge research. I was there last week visiting several of these research institutes on the Centennial campus. I'm particularly excited to speak today about the bill that I introduced with Representative Baird, which he discussed, the NSF Technology Research Institutes Act. The bill, which is now included in the NSF for the Futures Act, would create an NSF program to provide grants to colleges and universities focused on key technology areas. U.S. leadership in science and technology is crucial to sustaining our leadership on the global stage. The grants will be used for fundamental and experimental research activities focused on solving societal or national challenges in addition to workforce development opportunities for researchers. The importance of academic institutions in creating robust innovation economies and highly trained workforce cannot be understated. It's no coincidence that with universities and colleges with my, in my district, full of students and researchers pursuing STEM careers, Raleigh, North Carolina ranks number two in the nation in technology and job growth and North Carolina leads the country in rural clean energy jobs. The NSF Research Technology Institutes Act and both of the bills we're marking up today will help educate our students, train our workforce, grow our industries, and energize state, regional, and national economies. Thank you very much, Ms. 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 Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. Madam Chair, Ranking Member, um, I appreciate you holding this uh, markup. You know, I rise in strong support of the amendment in the nature of the substitute, which includes my legislation, H.R. 3859, the Innovations in Informer STEM Learning Act. This was introduced with my colleague, Representative Moore, Ranking Member Lucas, and Chairwoman Johnson. Thank you. This bill directs the NSF director to award competitive merit-reviewed grants to support the participation of students in competitions, after school activities, and field experiences related to STEM education by setting up the pre K through eighth grade informer STEM program. Under HR 3859, the grants will be used to advance the engagement in STEM of students in pre K through eighth grade. Additionally, 
This bill makes a concerted effort to bridge the achievement gap in STEM education with our minority and rural students by addressing activities outside of the classroom. Finally, the Innovations in Informer STEM Learning Act directs the NSF director to evaluate the pre-K through eighth grade Informer STEM program and report the evaluations of, uh, to Congress and provide recommendations that would improve the effectiveness of the program. In order for our country and to increase our competitiveness abroad, we should be focusing on bridging the achievement gap in STEM education at the elementary and secondary levels. And this bill aims to achieve that. I was also proud to support HR 3809, the Research Excellence Through STEM Ed Inclusion Act as an original co-sponsor with my colleague, Representative Bauman. The legislation was also included in today's ANS. The legislation would codify the Office of Diversity of Inclusion at the National Science Foundation. This legislation is important because it will provide oversight, guidance, and coordination to ensure we have a diverse set of researchers, students, and institutions contributing to our sciences. As our nation fights to stay ahead as a world leader in innovation, science, and technology, we must rely on the strengths of our nation's diversity. But we simply aren't doing enough to advance STEM with minority communities and women. For instance, women earn 85% of the bachelor's degrees in health-related fields, but just 22% in engineering and 19% in computer science as of 2018. As I've been saying, we cannot afford to compete in the 21st century economy with one hand tied behind our back. I commend Ranking Member Lucas and Chairwoman Johnson for your leadership in STEM education and for reaching a bipartisan agreement to pass this legislation. And I urge my colleagues to support the ANS and the broader piece of legislation, HR 2225. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Moore. Thank you so very, very much for recognizing me, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I am so absolutely pleased to be able to support a strong reauthorization of the NSF. Um, and as you heard from uh, Representative Kim, uh, so many important things are happening in this bill that I, I don't have enough time on the clock to be able to talk about every single thing that has been done. But so many important priorities are included. And I'm gonna talk about one such a priority uh, it, that is improving the diversity in STEM. And I, I, I applaud the thoughtful and bipartisan provisions that are included in this measure. I wanna particularly lift up the Chairwoman uh, Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas uh, for their just tireless uh, effort to make sure that this was a bipartisan and inclusive measure and for including uh, my bill, the Minority Serving uh, Institutions STEM Research Capabilities uh, in the uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute, as well as co-sponsoring it. When I introduced this provision as a standalone bill, this important legislation would promote STEM capacity uh, for building for minority serving institutions like Alverno College in my district in Milwaukee or Mount Mary College in Milwaukee, both of them being Hispanic serving institutions. Uh, these uh, MSIs would include all of our HBCUs, tribal colleges and universities. And again, Hispanic serving institutions uh, under uh, this umbrella are very important to me uh, personally for my district. You know what? If we wanna create the researchers of the future, we need to meet the students to be able to join with Kim in starting that education at a young age. Um, um, you know, it, it's not enough to just say that we want to increase diversity. Uh, everybody is for that conceptually. We need to provide those institutions the tools that they need to build out their programs. 
And minority serving institutions have some of the most talented students in our country, and we need their great minds to meet the challenges of today. We have seen in real time and in real life the importance of having diverse points of view in every aspect of science and business. The best decisions are being made by the intellectual gathering of diverse minds. And we know that underrepresented students have the talent. We just need to give them the chance. And what makes this legislation unique is that these MSI programs will be able to partner with their local technical community colleges, giving students who may not be able to afford a four-year university, uh, uh, they're able to still participate in STEM. Yes, STEM is needed at the community college level. This change complements another provision I worked with on, uh, in on this legislation, which was uh, adopted during a subcommittee markup to increase efforts by the NSF to partner with these community colleges to strengthen their research efforts. We need to meet students where they are. And for many students of color who we would like to engage more in STEM, that can be in that local community college. With these types of investments, we can usher in the next generation of scientists, erode racial imbalances in education and research, and expand opportunities in science and technology to traditionally underrepresented people of color. Diversity makes our research better and our institutions strong. And I'm so proud to have partnered with the chairwoman and the ranking member on this important issue, and I yield back. Thank you so much for allowing me the privilege to serve on this wonderful committee. Thank you very much. Mr. Obernolte. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify in support of the amendment. I'm a strong supporter of not only this amendment, but the underlying legislation uh, to reauthorize the National Science Foundation and endow it with the necessary tools to keep our country competitive. I'd also like to thank you very much for including my legislation, the Fellowships and Traineeships for Early Career AI Researchers Act, in the amendment. Uh, as a computer scientist myself, I believe that future investment in artificial intelligence is going to be critical for the long-term success of our economy and the long-term competitiveness of our country. But I also am concerned that we underinvest. And in particular, I'm concerned that we don't have enough graduate students uh, that are going into artificial intelligence. I can tell you from personal experience, it's a very difficult field to get in. And uh, so uh, I'm very pleased that this legislation includes provisions to endow scholarships for master's and doctoral students in artificial intelligence, and also to endow fellowships uh, to enable uh, these early career researchers to get experience in artificial intelligence, which is uh, a very diverse field, and a very difficult field to get into. So I want to thank uh, Representative McDerney for working with me on this legislation. And also thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, our ranking member, Lucas, for including it in this bill. I'm proud to be a part of it, and I am in strong support of it and uh, I'm glad to help. So I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Foster. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair Willard. Uh, this ANS and the legislation we are considering today represents the culmination of the historic development <clears throat> that started in this committee during the last Congress when we saw dueling proposals from each side of the aisle to roughly double the science budget in this country. The bipartisan leadership of the Science Committee deserves tremendous credit for bringing forth these bills in a unified manner and in a manner that truly recognizes the importance of our federal scientific infrastructure and manpower and as the ranking member has emphasized, recognizes the preferability of expanding funding to existing and proven projects and programs rather than reinventing and rebranding the wheel. It is not an accident that these house bills have received overwhelming support from the scientific and business communities, while the competing alternative from the Senate, maybe not so much. As the NSF makes plans to use this overdue expansion and funding for its programs in basic and applied scientific research, it, it should be assured that Congress is prepared to support this endeavor no matter which party is in control of Congress. I urge my colleagues to support this ANS and this legislation yield back. Is there uh, any additional comments? If there are, we will move. If we, if we do not have any additional comments, we'll move to our First Amendment. 
The first commandment uh, on the roster is an amendment offered by a gentlelady from California, Ms. Laughlin. Ms. Laughlin um, had to step away, but I'll ask the clerk to read it. Amendment number two, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Ms. Lofgren of California. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read and without objection, so ordered. I recognize myself to speak on the amendment for Ms. Lofgren. Uh, authorizing committees such as the science committee to our best to propose authorization levels and make sense. But sometimes we may be too cautious. We may look forward, uh, look backward to what appropriations have been and in comparison to past authorizations. And that disappointment colors our thinking of what is possible. However, the nation is at an end reflection point on so many fronts. And if there was ever a time to look forward with a bolder vision of what is possible, that time is now. We have heard from one expert and report after report about what is possible if we are willing to invest. We heard from the National Science Foundation director himself how the agency could absorb a near-term doubling of their budget. Specifically, the agency would use increased funds to right-size the duration and amount of grants and fund more excellent science. I want to thank Ms. Larkin for her insistence and we look forward uh, to uh, imagine what is both needed and what is possible. And I thank Ranking Member Lucas and, Rep and, and Republican committee staff for working across the aisle on this amendment. Every new number proposed in this amendment was developed with a clear, clear strategy and justification. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas. Madam Mr. Lucas. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. And uh, Chairwoman Lofgren for working with me to achieve a compromise on this amendment to increase the authorization for NSF over the next uh, five years by an additional $5 billion. I know Ms. Lofgren's initial ambitions for this amendment were to increase the authorization much higher, and I appreciate the gentle lady and her staff working with us on a compromise I think that achieves both our goals. My priority uh, all along has been to double funding for NSF in a way that is achievable and sustainable. This amendment accelerates funding for NSF faster than our original bill as it launches a new directorate, but does so in a way that will not cause immediate drop off in funding increases afterwards. And I actually believe this amendment grows the new directorate in a more appropriate annual funding level in the final year of the authorization, one that is the proportion to the rest of the foundation. If we get to the point of confer, conferencing our bill with the Senate, I'm sure these funding levels will be a vigorous source of debate, but we'll set an appropriate benchmark. I look forward to working with the chairwoman and other members of the committee to make sure we get it right in the final product. I appreciate the chairwoman and staff for working overtime on the math to get this amendment right, and I hope my colleagues will support this amendment, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any further discussion on this amendment? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye, and those opposed, no. Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Foster Amendment. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number three, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Foster of Illinois. 
I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, um, my amendment deals with one of the most vexing and uncontrolled variables that in my many years of experience in the planning and execution of scientific projects and programs caused great difficulties and misunderstandings, which is inflation. While making authorization decisions on a multi -year, uh, for multi-year programs and projects, Congress rightly expects realistic budget estimates. This requires an estimate of what inflation will be in future years. The, these inflation estimates are often taken from guidance from the Office of Management and Budget with adjustments made by the agencies to reflect individual inflation estimates for different project elements, whether they be liquid helium, rare earth magnets, or technical manpower. Right now, there's a lot of uncertainty in the inflation expected over the next decade because of the shocks of COVID-19, the aftershocks of the financial crisis a decade ago, and the extraordinary monetary and fiscal intervention that's been required to stabilize our economy. Uh, since scientific projects must be planned and budgeted in real terms after correction for inflation, it's the purpose of my amendment to make sure that NSF knows that if inflation exceeds current estimates, that we will support them by authorizing budget levels that preserve real levels of investment. Now, it has come to my understanding that this sort of commitment to ensure real inflation adjusted authorizations is not conventionally allowed under our longstanding and arcane traditions of authorization and appropriations procedures. So with regret, I reiterate my belief that scientific program authorizations should be automatically adjusted to reflect actual inflation in all years. And I withdraw my amendment and yield back. Thank you very much. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babbitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Report the amendment. Amendment number four. Amendment to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Babin of Texas. I ask the members to proceed to dispense with the reading. Yeah. And I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain Thank his you. amendment. One of the greatest assets we have here in this country, a free country, is the partnership between our vibrant venture capital market and the federal investment in science and technology. When we fully utilize the R&D capabilities of our industry, we can dominate global innovation in s and and we absolutely have. However, the threat of adversarial larceny that we face in this industry greatly undermines this investment. If we don't protect our scientific innovations and the hard-earned taxpayer money that we are authorizing, we cripple the competitive advantage that we have in developing cutting-edge technology. It is our duty in this committee to make sure that provisions are included in any bill as we move forward that protect our investments in science, space, and technology. As I mentioned earlier, we must take action against countries like China who come in and steal our research and our knowledge. And that is why I introduced this amendment, which simply says that no funding authorized in this bill shall go toward any institution that has ties to the Confucius Institutes because of their relationship to the Communist Chinese Party and the concerns and criticisms of issuing Communist Chinese Party propaganda and undermining academic freedom, engaging in industrial and military espionage, surveillance of Chinese students abroad, and advancing the Chinese government's agendas. And while I plan on withdrawing this amendment, I would like to make clear that this must remain a priority, a top priority for this committee. And I will continue to advocate for the, and the, for the strongest possible measures against foreign espionage of our science and technology. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, I will throw this amendment and I will yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Babin. I appreciate your sentiments and I appreciate the fact that you're withdrawing it until we can vet it to make sure that we are in course with the um, research enterprise. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, our next amendment is another one from Ms. Larkin. And um, she 
Uh, it's still not back, but um, I will present her amendment. So I ask unanimous consent uh, that the amendment be considered. A clerk will read the amendment. Amendment number five, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Ms. Lofgren of California. Without objection, the, um, the, the Lofgren amendment is recognized. Uh, I want to thank her for this amendment. It updates the existing provision to expand eligibility for professional development funding. Uh, to postdoctoral researchers. A 2018 National Academy study raised concerns that graduate STEM students have too few opportunities to develop the professional and personal skills in high demand by employers. The study recommended that universities and funding agencies take steps to better prepare graduate students for a wide range of career paths. Postdoctoral scholars will benefit equally from these opportunities as they pursue their diverse career paths. And I urge my colleagues uh, to support this good amendment and I yield back. Any further discussion on this amendment? If there's no further discussion, the, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is amendment offered by a gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Wild, and she's recognized to offer her amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will, you, will read the amendment. Amendment number six. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of the substitute to HR 2225 offered by Ms. Wild of Pennsylvania. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so order. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity today to act on a bipartisan basis to invest in our country's scientific and research leadership with the NSF for the Future Act. Our committee often hears from a range of stakeholders about the need to support STEM students and the research and workforce pipeline. The NSF for the Future Act rightly considers how we can modernize STEM education to support graduate students through school and into their early career. And I believe as part of this work, we must know a rising issue for students, their mental health and well being. A recent study from the National Academies highlights what students, faculty, and administrators have been seeing for years a pervasive and serious need to address mental and behavioral health issues. The past 16 months of pandemic and recession, disrupting learning and research have certainly amplified the challenges to graduate students' mental health. But these concerns predate the pandemic. In a 2018-19 Health Minds survey, 40% of post-secondary students reported a significant mental health issue. University leaders have been working to address the issue. But our committee must play a key role in supporting the research that understands and informs the need for more services and support. To address this, my amendment expands on this bill's current graduate education research provisions to direct the National Science Foundation to fund research that assesses the state of graduate students' mental health and well being, identifies the factors affecting their health and develops evidence-based approaches to supporting students' mental health and emotional well-being. In speakers with leaders at Lehigh University in my district, they all agree that more has to be done to support the graduate student population whose experiences and needs are distinct from those of undergraduates. The bill we consider today is a vital investment in our nation's scientific leadership. 
but our success in this endeavor depends on us recognizing and prioritizing the health and well being of our students and researchers. For that reason, I urge adoption of my amendment and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I might add that I support this amendment. Uh, any other comments? If not, then the vote occurs on this amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is one offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Walsh, and he's recognized to offer his amendment. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number seven, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Waltz of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Yeah, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, uh, for the opportunity to speak on this amendment. Uh, the NSF's Cyber Corps Scholarship for Service Program, its SFS program, has two primary goals. One, to increase the number of employees working in cybersecurity, and two, to increase the capacity of U.S. higher education to produce those cyber professionals. It's notable that the SFS program has placed 3,200 students in 357 government organizations with a placement rate of 95%. Top placements in government include uh, the NSA, DOD, and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this program is helping our national security agencies recruit and retain elite cyber talent. And in fact, the 2020 Cyberspace Solarium Commission report recommends growing the SFS program to reach 2,000 students per year. Uh, considering the necessity of elite cyber talent within the federal government. Uh, I think we've all seen that need in, uh, in recent months, in particular, uh, as have they've been highlighted by recent cyber attacks. My amendment seeks to ensure the SFS program is meeting the forward-looking goals and strategic objectives of the federal government to deter, protect, detect, and respond to cyber threats. Uh, Integral to maintaining a competitive edge in cyber is prioritizing AI and quantum. Uh, additionally, given the growing prevalence of unmanned aerial vehicles in American aerospace and American airspace, plus the high placement rate of SFS students at DOD, which is nearly a third, it's necessary to clarify that aerospace cyber is a focus area for the program. My amendment simply ensures the National Science Foundation is considering AI, quantum, and aerospace as it selects participating institutions and scholarship recipients. Said another way, my amendment seeks to clarify that NSF is focusing on these areas. This amendment does not exclude or disadvantage other cyber topics like crypto, uh, biometrics, behavioral sciences, or others. It simply ensures the SFS program stays on the cutting edge in the rapidly developing areas of AI, quantum, and aerospace. And I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. I yield back. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on that amendment? The vote occurs on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, Mr. Posey has an amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number eight, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Posey of Florida. As we now have consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so order. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. My amendment also addresses the recommendation made by the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, which uh, Congressman Waltz just referenced. Uh, while we know our nation's cyber workforce needs are great, uh, we do not have the qualitative data necessary to effectively understand and address the need. Uh, this 
amendment directs the National Science Foundation to expand the mandate of National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics to produce a statistical insight into America's cybersecurity workforce to better understand uh, the current state of the cyber workforce, uh, paths to entry, uh, demographic trends of the cyber workforce, and other relevant data. Uh, having this information uh, will have a better picture of our nation's cyber workforce needs and will help inform uh, the interventions needed to recruit and retain cyber professionals. I'm, I'm delighted the majority has agreed to accept this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further discussion on the amendment? I support the amendment and the, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Hearing none, the amendment is adopted. The next amendment on the roster is by Mr. Piastra. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number nine, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Feenstra of Iowa. The, 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 I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. My amendment is fairly simple. It directs the National Science Foundation to prohibit grantees from participating in malign foreign talent programs from countries of concern while they are receiving an NSF grant. These countries, as identified by the State Department, are currently China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. I want to thank Congressman Waltz for joining me in introducing this amendment. For years, Congress, federal research agencies, the national security agencies, and universities have been working to root out malign foreign talent recruitment. The time has come to simply prohibit them from receiving U.S. taxpayer dollars. The Chinese government knows that economic strength and scientific innovation are keys to global influence and military power. So the Chinese Communist Party aims to acquire our early stage research and expertise to erode our competitive advantage. As part of this effort, China has been making extensive use of non-traditional collectors. These individuals are not spies in the traditional sense, but they are nonetheless collecting information sought by the Chinese government. Until recently, many US researchers participating in these programs may have been naive or unwitting participants in this espionage, but they are no longer, but can no longer claim ignorance. My amendment defines malign foreign talent programs as any program or activity that includes compensation, including cash, research funding, honor horrific titles, promised future compensation or other types of remuneration provided by a foreign state or an entity sponsored by the foreign state to the targeted individual in exchange for the individual transferring knowledge or expertise to the foreign country. The key word here is in exchange. We know from foreign talent contracts that have been uncovered by the FBI and agency investigations that Chinese talent programs have extensive requirements for transfer of information to China, usually in the conflict with the requirements of US research grants and university employment contracts. Let me be clear, legitimate talent programs do not require the unethical or sometimes illegal transfer of knowledge or research to sponsor. My amendment also makes clear that we are not trying to prohibit the legitimate exchange of scientific ideas and collaboration. It explicitly states that this prohibit, the prohibitation should not prevent participation in international conferences, scholarly and scholarly presentations of open research. This amendment was in, informed by feedback from university associations and several scientific societies. University and scientists want clear rules for the road, and this will help them provide that type of guidance. I consider this amendment as a first step. The rules should be the same for all federal research agencies. So I hope I can work together with the co-sponsor of my amendment, Con Congressman Waltz, as well as Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas, to make this government-wide prohibition through the legislation process. 
I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and I yield back the remaining remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize myself to speak on this amendment. And I wanna thank you and the Republican committee staff for working closely with the Democratic members and staff on this amendment. Uh, this committee on a bipartisan basis has continued to advance constructive policies to address research security risk. We all understand that the risks are real. We also understand that the need for science to remain open and collaborative. And we have a deep appreciation for the contributions that foreign scholars have and will continue to make to US science and innovation. We must keep our doors open to global talent if we are to remain competitive. I believe this amendment was carefully developed to balance those risks and benefits. So I support this amendment and yield back. Any further comments? Mr. Lucas. If no, then the vote occurs. Mr. Mr. Lucas wants to be recognized. Oh, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support, I support this amendment and I want to thank Congressman Feenstra and Ranking Member Waltz for their work on this issue. For the last four years on a bipartisan basis, the Science Committee has been working to address foreign theft taxpayer research, particularly by the Chinese Communist Party. I know that research theft and malign foreign influence are explicit strategies within the CCP's plan to become the global leader in science innovation. Our committee has carefully worked with federal research and national security agencies, as well as universities and other stakeholders to determine the appropriate steps the federal government should take to stop this malign activity. We've worked to find solutions that address actual problems identified by agencies and universities without harming the open research system in the US that has attracted the best scientists in the world. This amendment ensures that legitimate international cooperation and exchange of scientific ideas is not prohibited by this new policy. This amendment is the appropriate next step we must take to stop the CCP and others from using malign foreign talent programs to steal knowledge and expertise. I appreciate the university community working with us to refine the language of the amendment and for recognizing the time has come to simply prohibit these malign foreign talent programs. I look forward to working with my colleagues through the process to make this require, a requirement across all federal research agencies and I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. I need to go back to the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Walsh, I think is requested time. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. I am proud to co-sponsor this amendment with my colleague, Congressman Fenstra. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this prohibition on US taxpayer funded research uh, participating in malign foreign talent programs is many years overdue, uh, but I am glad universities uh, are now on board. Two years ago, I sponsored the Securing American Science and Technology Act, uh, which became law as part of the FY19 NDAA. This was the first step Congress took to secure federal research from foreign theft last year. I sponsored the provision that took the next step to require researchers across all federal research agencies to disclose their foreign sources of funding. Uh, in the underlying NSF for the Future Act, we give NSF further tools to deal with foreign theft of foundation funded research, including requiring annual training uh, for NSF funded researcher. This amendment takes the next step and in many ways simplifies many of the rules and processes we put into place by simply prohibiting malign foreign talent programs. Uh, we know that most of these talent program contracts already violate federal grant terms and conditions, but now there will be no question left in the mind of a faculty member of a university of whether or not participation is allowed. Now, while this amendment is only a requirement for NSF, which is germane uh, for this market, my intention is that this should serve as a placeholder for government-wide requirement. I will work with Mr. Fenstra, uh, with you, Chairwoman Johnson, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Lucas, uh, as we move forward on the next NDAA to make this a requirement for every federal research agency. Uh, we make the investments in, in science and technology that NSF for the Future proposes, but we also need to make sure the research isn't transferred right out the back door to Beijing. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you very much. Any further comments? 
Hearing none, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted. Uh, the next amendment is by Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. report the amendment. I have an amendment at the desk. Amendment number 10. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2225, offered by Mr. McNerney of California and Mr. Mayor of Michigan. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so order. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Again, I thank the chairwoman. Uh, and I want to thank my colleague from Michigan, Mr. Meyer, for his co-sponsorship of this amendment to the NSF of the Futures Act. Climate change is an increasing threat to our communities, our economy, our national security, with devastating impacts expected in the next 10 to 30 years. First and foremost, we must commit to aggressively reducing carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions, as well as three carbon through agriculture and forestry, and from captured emissions from smokestacks and from direct air capture. But there's enough carbon and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere right now, today, to continue to the threat of atmospheric heating and oceanic warming and with the resulting threats to our society. Moreover, even, more, even the most optimistic projections predict that we'll take decades to reduce carbon emissions to equilibrium levels, leaving us at the mercy of climate warming without any insurance against the near-term catastrophic risks. We may need to actively cool the atmosphere. Because of this, it's critical that we have a robust science research agenda that policymakers, US agencies, and the broader research community can take guidance from. We must examine all the potential tools we have in our toolbox with an objective view and let the science guide the research agenda. To ignore this imminent threat would be irresponsible and potentially dangerous. Additionally, it's imperative that science and the research agenda inform all aspects of this arena, including the policies of governance. These two go hand in hand. Research and information are required for good governance. It's not an either or situation. In order to assess, predict, and potentially intervene against the threat of climate change, there is a first need for a consideration of the entire system of observations, analysis, and scientific resources and technology. That's why I'm offering an amendment which allows for the use of funds on the climate change research to understand the atmospheric process related to solar radiation management strategies and technologies. Furthermore, the research would examine related economic, geopolitical, social, Uh, sorry, he got muted. What do you mention it? I just unmuted myself. Yeah, okay. Thanks for muting me. <laughs> uh, this, this amendment does not, does not, I repeat, does not include research designed to advance future deployment of these strategies and technologies. We simply need to research and computer model uh, to inform us. Is climate intervention viable or is it too risky? Does the risk of climate intervention outweigh the risk of unimpeded climate change? It will take about a decade to develop the science and technology needed for any future deployment. In the meantime, new ideas might be and hopefully will be developed from this research to draw climate out of the atmosphere and eliminate carbon emissions or fight climate change in other ways. But we cannot just hide our heads in the sand and hope for the best. The threat posed by climate change is unlike any threat humanity has faced, and we must explore every single avenue available. Some research in solar radiation management strategies is already taking place, some of in China, and it's imperative that the appropriate authorities are leading this initiative to ensure safe practices are being promoted and proper governance is being applied. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you. Any further discussion? Any requests for time? No, 
If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 The ayes have the amendment is agreed to. Mr. Paul Mother has an amendment. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 11, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2225, offered by Mr. Perlmutter of Colorado and Ms. Lofgren. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objections to order. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you and Mr. Lucas for your leadership on this bill. Uh, the amendment that Ms. Lofgren and I offer is simple. It ensures NSF's risk and resilience research includes a focus on wildfire science and the impact wildfires have on air quality, human behavior, and how to improve early detection uh, of these fires. I want to thank my colleague, uh, Representative Lofgren, for joining me as a co-sponsor of this amendment and for her work to advance wildfire science and protect our communities across the West that have been devastated by wildfires. Colorado just had its worst wildfire season on record. The three largest wildfires in our state's history occurred in 2020. Climate change is now forcing Colorado and many other states to prepare for larger and more destructive wildfire seasons. In fact, the director of the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control just remarked, we're having fire years, not fire seasons anymore. As the number of people moving to fire prone areas continues to grow, it's more important than ever we find more effective ways to protect people's lives, their homes and our natural resources. We need to understand more about wildfires so we can best invest in ways to protect our communities and our natural resources. Our amendment will help to do exactly that by ensuring NSF supports researchers like those at my alma mater, the University of Colorado, further their work in wildfire science. By expanding our investments in this important research, we can better prepare for and mitigate the effects of wildfires. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues on this committee to further strengthen wildfire science and research across all federal agencies and we can take the first step towards that by including our amendment uh, today. Again, I wanna thank Representative Lofgren and I urge all my colleagues to support our amendment and the underlying bill and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further discussion on this amendment? Madam Chair, I wish to be recognized, please. Ms. Bonamici. Ms. Bonamici, recognized. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. She will recognize for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank my colleagues, Mr. Perlmutter and Ms. Lofgren, for um, offering this important amendment. Uh, as we heard about Colorado, uh, my home state of Oregon had the most devastating year last year with wildfires. Uh, about a million acres burned, 11 people lost their lives, and thousands of homes were destroyed. Anything we can do to get more research and prevention and prediction will be beneficial. I urge all of my colleagues to support this important amendment, which of course I would have co-sponsored with Mr. Perlmutter, but uh, at this point I'm proud and happy to speak in favor of. So uh, thank you to, to Mr. Perlmutter, Ms. Lofgren for offering this. Uh, I hope you will all support it and I yield back the balance of my time. Would the gentlelady lady yield? Uh, if I can, I already yielded back, but... Uh, well, I, I thought you didn't co-sponsor because the Nuggets beat the Trailblazers, but I'll yield back. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely will yield back now. <laughs> Thank you. Any further discussion? The vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. no. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. The next amendment is Mr. Walsh. Uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 12. 
Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2225, offered by Mr. Wells of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispose with reading the amendment without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Johnson, uh, for the opportunity to speak on this amendment. Uh, when making these investments uh, in NSF for the future, we must also consider the benefits of collaborative research uh, with our allies. Uh, the United States and its partner nations are capable of addressing 21st century challenges together in a manner that safeguards uh, intellectual property. For example, we have experienced significant gains in binational research efforts mm -hmm. with Israel. Uh, for over nearly 50 years, the U.S.-Israel Binational Foundations have combined, uh, combined have supported more than 7,300 projects, and the U.S.-Israel Binational Science Foundation has awarded over $700 million uh, to more than 5,000 research projects. The economic and scientific successes attributed to binational R&D partnership cannot be overlooked. Uh, it is imperative that we take advantage of these opportunities to work with our partner nations in reaching our R&D goals. Uh, I firmly believe the U.S. can maintain its global competitive edge in the R&D space, and I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Hearing none, then the um, the vote uh, occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. The next amendment on the roster is offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. He's recognized for his amendment. I thank the chair. I uh, have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 13. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2225, offered by Mr. McNerney of California and Mr. Feenstra of Iowa. As unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. And I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Well, I thank the chair and the ranking member and the staff on both sides uh, for their work. And I also especially want to thank my colleague from Iowa, Mr. Fenstra, for his uh, work in support in this legislation. Uh, agriculture is the biggest single sector in my district. So this is really important to me. Accurate, reliable, and continuously available GPS enables farmers to increase crop yields, crop efficiencies, and, and environmental sustainability through the precise application of seed, water, fertilizers, and pesticides. GPS is also used for protecting animal health. In practice, GPS helps farmers uh, waste less seed, requires less fertilizer, less fuel, less pesticide, and ultimately has better crop up yield. So therefore, uh, it's vital that we include this to ensure that uh, the GAO considers GPS applications in their technology assessment of precision agriculture technologies. I yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Feenster. Mr. Feenster. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to speak on this amendment. Gentlemen's um, recognized. Thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Matt McInerney, for the opportunity to work together with you on advancing the IOT for Precision Agriculture Act. I am proud to have helped uh, lead this legislation, uh, which is included in H.R. 2225 and the underlying text of this bill. I am also glad to co-sponsor the amendment to make sure GPS application potential is assessed. Uh, in my district, many farmers rely on precision agriculture technology to effectively utilize resources in the fields and maintain their uh, farms. These technologies help them manage their crops, the health of the soil, and then the application of fertilizer. Precision agriculture principles not only help farmers manage farms effectively, they also benefit the environment and improve sustainability. 
This amendment focuses on the GAO uh, review portion of the advancing IOT from precision agriculture, including GPS-based applications in the GAO's assessment is crucial to ensuring progress. Precision agriculture relies on geolocation to determine the health of soil and crops in specific sections of land on farmland that can be used in, on thousands of acres without ensuring specific focus on GPS applications. The GAO, GAO review may miss, miss vital technologies that could benefit farmers. I am happy to work with Representative McInerney on this act and amendment. Advancing precision agriculture is a bipartisan issue, and I hope that we as a committee will vote to include the GPS application amendment. I yield back the remaining part of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Then the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. I mean, yeah, nay. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is offered by a gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment with the clerk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment number 14, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Byer. As unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. And I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. I'm introducing this amendment to support research to address the impact of commercial satellite constellations on ground-based astronomy. As we know, there are more than 3,000 operational satellites in low Earth orbit right now, with perhaps 10,000 more to be added next year and another 10,000 after that. This is a time-sensitive issue because more and more constellations are planned for launch. And we need to give astronomers the resources and tools necessary to minimize any negative impacts on their science through things like changes to observatory operations and new image analysis tools. With the incredible promise of satellites in low Earth orbit, we can't ignore the consequence on ground-based astronomy. So this is particularly the case with the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is coming online soon. So I urge my colleagues to support this measure just to study this research and authorize the National Science Foundation to do this important work. Thanks, Madam Chair, and I yield back. I'm sorry, I might have been mooted. Um, the the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Aye. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Our next amendment is on from by Mr. Lamb and the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, and the the uh, he's recognized for his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 15, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 2225 offered by Mr. Lamb. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading uh, without objection so ordered and I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I offer this amendment because I think we're all circling around the problem of, of trying to eliminate or close the, the valley of death between research and taking some of the great research findings into uh, products and processes that can be brought to market. And I wanna make sure we remember that sometimes the most important ingredient in all of that is the people. Um, anyone who knows an entrepreneur uh, knows that there's certain qualities that they bring and, and a lot of times they can be spotted. And so this amendment uh, will allow us to recruit uh, recent PhDs uh, who have entrepreneurial tendencies and desires and experience um, to receive a fellowship that will help them get their ideas off to, off the ground and into a business setting. Um, and it will ensure that they do so in the context of a research institution. And um, it will also ensure that we reach out to a 
wide array of communities so that every American has a chance for this type of opportunity, um, including the communities that have uh, so often in the past been ignored or deprived of these important opportunities. It will ensure that that we really market uh, and extend this to, to everybody with a good idea and something to contribute. So I ask the support of my fellow committee members uh, on both sides, and I thank the chair for the opportunity to make this amendment. I yield back. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, then it, uh, the um, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. The next amendment on the roster is um, offered by the general from Illinois, Mr. Foster. He is recognized to speak on his amendment. Yep, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 16. Amendment to the amendment and the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2225 offered by Mr. Foster of Illinois. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading and I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, significant portions of this bill deal with ways in which our nation can build and retain a STEM workforce that will keep our, fund, our country innovating long into the future. One of the major ways that we build this workforce is through enhancing STEM education, especially for those coming from disadvantaged backgrounds. And there are a number of fantastic provisions in this bill to do just that. Often our efforts to assist those coming from disadvantaged backgrounds fall short in the area of graduate STEM education. And we must recognize that the scars from an economically disadvantaged family background do not disappear at the moment of receiving an undergraduate degree, even for the most brilliant students. And that economic stress is often a factor in a student failing to complete graduate STEM degrees. And also fees associated with non-funded graduate programs may prevent very qualified and willing students from being able to afford pursuing a master's degree or another program. The Graduate Research Fellowship Program, for example, offers stipends to graduate students in STEM fields in order to help them pursue that degree. However, programs like this are missing a needs-based component in their award allocation. However, the NSF's existing Scholarships in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics program, or S-STEM, provides funding to individual schools and university to fill this need by assisting STEM students at all levels of education. From this funding, 60% goes towards scholarships for low-income but academically talented students with demonstrated financial need who are pursuing associate, baccalaureate, or graduate degrees in STEM fields. Other funding goes toward curriculum, professional, and workforce development activities for the recipients of those scholarships, but it lacks adequate and predictable NSF-appropriated funds. This amendment would provide authorized funding for this program, allowing it to increase its impact on creating the STEM workforce of the future. I strongly encourage you all to support this amendment and yield back. Sorry, uh, Ms. Moore is recognized. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, this is such a wonderful, wonderful uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, but I would, would ask if uh, Dr. Foster would consider uh, adding me as a co-sponsor to this amazing amendment. Absolutely. Thank you, and I, I yield back. Without objection, I... Uh, I am pleased to associate the Representative Moore's name with this amendment. Thank you. Any further comment? Hearing none, then the um, vote occurs on the amendment with the addition of Ms. Moore's name as a sponsor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Now we will now vote on the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. The vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. All those Aye. opposed say no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Now, we are ready to report uh, the bill, the quorum being present. I move that the Committee on Science, Space and Technology report H.R. 2225 as amendment, amended uh, to the House with the recommendation that the bill be approved. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Hearing none, the ayes have it and the bill is favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table and I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. And members will have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplementary, minority or additional views to this measure. Now that we um, we will now consider the next bill, 3593, after a five-minute break. In five minutes, I'll see you. <laughs>
of 93, the Department of Energy Science for the Future Act. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 3593, the Department of Energy Science for the Future Act. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Does anyone wish to be recognized uh, to speak on this underlying bill? No? Okay, then we will proceed with the amendments in order on the roster. So our first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by myself. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3593 offered by Mr. Ms. Johnson of Texas. As unanimous consent to dispense with the reading and without objection, so order. I recognize myself for five minutes to explain this amendment. I'm very pleased to offer this amendment in the nature of the substitute for the Department of Energy Science for the Future Act, alongside ranking member Lucas. I'm going to speak briefly and place my extended remarks in the record. We all know that the United States faced increased international competition in science and technology. The only way we will be able to face that challenge is if we are all willing to work together. I truly appreciate the collaboration on this amendment by Ranking Member Lucas and all the members of the committee, Democrats and Republicans. I think this bill will be better for that collaboration. And in return, our nation will be better off. Is there any further discussion on this amendment? Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. This amendment strikes and replaces the text of H.R. 3593, the DOE Science for the Future Act, to incorporate stakeholder feedback to the underlying bill and make technical changes to the text. I'd like to thank the chairwoman and her staff for working with us in a bipartisan and cooperative manner to get these necessary changes finalized. Among these changes, this amendment includes several important provisions from my bill, H.R. 5685, the Securing American Leadership in Science and Technology Act, including a DOE infectious disease R&D initiative and full funding for the quantum user expansion for science and technologies program. This past year, the Department of Energy and its national labs have demonstrated the value of using high-performance supercomputing advanced research facilities to model COVID-19, understand its effects on human cells, and predict its spread. DOE and the U.S. research community have done incredible work in using the department's world-leading resources to fight this pandemic and address the many challenges it has presented. DOE and its Office of Science should continue to play a key role in emerging infectious disease research for many years to come. That's why my SOLSTA includes a comprehensive authorization for this work. By establishing a cross-cutting emerging infection disease research initiative and a high-performance computing research consortium, we can, continue, we can ensure the continuation of these life-saving R&D activities. I'm pleased to see this amendment included these high priority provisions. I'm also glad to see that this amendment updates the original bill to include full support for the Quest program and unsolved priority, which is public-private partnerships and quantum resource use. Quantum information science will revolutionize our relationship with technology and our capacity for scientific advancement. In order to remain competitive in the critical industry of the future, we need to take the long-term and big-picture approach and get serious about our investments in quantum computing and in the U.S. quantum industry. By giving U.S. researchers access to quantum computing hardware and quantum computing clouds, the Quest program encourages greater participation in the development of quantum information sciences, thereby facilitating a larger and more diverse range of research into these evolving technologies. I also, once again, would like to thank Chairman, Chairwoman Johnson for working with me to get these critical provisions added to this amendment. 
And as always, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work alongside my science committee colleagues to prioritize fundamental research that will support U.S. innovation, keep our country safe, independent, and globally competitive. This bipartisan Office of Science Reauthorization has been a long time coming for the Science Committee. This is a product we should all be proud of, and today's amendment brings us one step closer to its enactment. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognize Ms. Moore. You're muted. Okay, I think I got it now. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for your just impeccable uh, work on uh, on uh, this uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR uh, 3593. Um, I, uh, before I get into my remarks, I, I absolutely want to lift up the names of uh, the subcommittee chair, uh, Bowman and ranking member uh, Weber uh, for really putting in such a, a robust uh, effort to advance our research into energy biology and climate science. You know, um, access to clean uh, drinking water rests at the nexus of both our nation's infrastructure debate and our climate crisis. And as a native of Wisconsin, I'm vested in, acculturated, committed, and heir to the value of clean air and water as inspired by the late great Wisconsin governor and Wisconsin United States Senator Gaylord Nelson, the father of Earth Day, uh, celebrated annually on April 22nd globally by uh, billions of people in 193 countries. That's my culture that I bring to this committee. And in the Great Region, Great Lakes region uh, proper, we're seeing warmer, wetter summers, the increased run off into lake systems are bringing more contaminants to both the lakes and our groundwater. And of course, the illnesses that occur from uh, greenhouse gases are really devastating to people like me and my daughter who have asthma and other underlying respiratory conditions. And as I've said before, you know, making clean water accessible is, requires investments in new ideas. And while we're reauthorizing the DOE science portfolio, I believe it's important that some of this research be directed towards further understanding the complex earth cycles that affect our drinking water. My amendment does just that by requiring DOE's Office of Science to support interdisciplinary clean water and watershed research into the activities both human and natural, that affect water availability and quality across our country, including in freshwater environments like our Great Lakes. This is so needed, not only for city dwellers, but for our farmers as well, um, who suffer from some contaminated runoffs. Additionally, my amendment requires a DOE in carrying out that work to do it in partnership uh, with representatives from state, local, and tribal governments research and academic institutions and nonprofit organizations like the Milwaukee Water Council. This amendment ensures that this will be a priority at the DOE Office of Science. And I look forward to seeing some of the new research and innovative technology that springs from such research to help protect our nation's water. You know, old African proverb says water has no enemies and we gotta make that true by treating it uh, I'll try not to repeat the many praises we've heard thus far for the legislation. Praises we've heard thus far for the legislation, even though many of those praises are certainly worth repeating. I do want to say thank you, as uh, Congressman Woman Moore, the general lady from Wisconsin, for her kind words. I appreciate that. Let me start by also expressing my gratitude to everyone involved on this committee for just how far we've come since I was first appointed committee. For just how far we've come since I was first appointed chairman. Chairman of the Energy Subcommittee in 2015, Pete's reauthorization process which provided important program direction for the Office of Science. Since then, we've had a number of landmark successes in updating this guidance. First, through the enactment of the Department of Energy Research and Innovation Act in 2018. And most recently, we were able to authorize pieces of the Office last Congress in the Energy Act of 2020. Yet after all these years and all this incredible bipartisan work, 
we've never had a comprehensive Office of Science reauthorization like the DOE Science for the Future Act. Over this time period, we've seen the tenant of the White House change twice. Countless members come and go, and, and even the controlling majority of this body change, darn. But through it all, Ranking Member Lucas, Chairwoman Johnson, and many others, including myself, have remained committed to keeping America's scientific enterprise at the absolute forefront of global competition. My colleagues have heard me repeatedly stress the importance of basic research. They've also heard me grumble and complain when I thought we were focusing too much on applied energy and increasing its already significant portion of DOE's budget. Might sound like a broken record, but it's because I believe so strongly in this. I'd like to thank my that like to think that my friends across the aisle and across the political spectrum really took note when within a year of ranking member Lucas's leadership, the Republican side of this committee put forth our benchmark legislation, the Security America Leadership in Science and Technology Act, or SALSTA. We put forth SALSTA as a signal that even in the minority, we are serious about the DOA Office of Science and its role in developing climate change solutions and advancing American competitiveness. And because of the competitive nature of SALSTA and its clear focus on basic federal research, I fully believe my Democrat colleagues recognized our effort as the start of a very tremendous and good and and well-deserved bipartisan opportunity. Because that is what the legislative process entails, isn't it? It's giving and taking, hearing many opinions inside, outside of these walls, disagreeing over some things, but yet finding common ground on more things. As a result, today marks the culmination of more than a decade of hard work. The legislation before us today is the first ever comprehensive reauthorization of the DOE Office of Science. And I couldn't be more thrilled about that. Some of the main pillars of this bill are funding construction and upgrades to major scientific user facilities, providing guidance in emerging research areas like quantum and responsibly increasing the annual budget for each of the office's core research programs. All of it is meant to put our full muscle behind the Office of Science. That is because time and time again, this office has demonstrated that basic science research is the most effective way to encourage the development of new technologies. If we want to maintain our technological edge and combat the threat countries like China are making towards our global leadership and innovation, this bill isn't just a recommendation or, or a message. It's an absolute necess necessity. Through the DOA Science of the Future Act, we are prioritizing critical research areas and investing in the science and technology that will drive the development of cleaner, more efficient, and more affordable energy. It wasn't the most direct path, I get it. And it certainly wasn't easy, but we're finally approaching the finish line. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues as we take this bill to the floor and on to the president's desk. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Lucas, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. I move to strike the last word. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for their work crafting this bipartisan bill to reauthorize the Office of Science, and I'm pleased to support it. The Department of Energy's Office of Science is helping to address the climate crisis and to accelerate our transition to a clean energy economy. As a member of the Energy Subcommittee, I have appreciated Chair Bowman's leadership to explore different facets of the research programs within the scope of the Office of Science. DOE's work contributes to important discoveries to decarbonize the electricity sector, strengthen quantum computing, support high energy physics, and more. During our hearing on the Basic Energy Sciences Program, we heard from witnesses about the office's work to advance battery technology development. Our hearing focused on high-performance computing and highlighted how future exascale capabilities will strengthen our understanding and response to the climate crisis. 
And as we recently heard during our budget hearing with Secretary Granholm, the Department of Energy has been woefully underfunded in light of the scope of its work in accelerating our clean energy transition. This bill takes important steps to leverage federal investments and advance the next generation of energy storage, solar, critical materials, and manufacturing technologies and more. I again want to thank Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for their bipartisan leadership. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment in the nature of a substitute, and I yield back the balance of time. Thank you very much. Mr. Posey. Uh, Lucas, strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. And I again want to echo the comments of the Ranking Member uh, concerning your leadership. I'm grateful and, and want to thank you and the ranking member that uh, this amendment includes additional language that directs the Department of Energy uh, to, in consultation with NASA, carry out basic research programs to compare the effects of exposure to low dose radiation on Earth and low Earth orbit and in the space environment. The ultimate goal of such research would be to inform low dose radiation practices here on Earth and to help facilitate long duration space flights. These provisions build on the success of my bill, uh, the Low Dose Radiation Research Act, which was signed into law last Congress as part of the Energy Act of 2020. The bill authorized a low dose radiation research program within the Department of Energy's Office of Science that we may continue to enhance our understanding of the effects of low dose radiation on human health, allowing us to make more risk informed approaches to management decisions regarding radiation exposure. NASA and the Department of Energy both exhibit great expertise in this area of research. And we know that the best science can occur when agencies work together. And it's great that this committee uh, is able to make those connections. This is especially true in science, and it's critical to our mission to push the limits of human exploration. Now, that's why I'm glad this amendment will further encourage and strengthen our co cooperation between NASA and the Department of Energy on this necessary work. It's kind of legislative initiative that helps our government avoid duplication of efforts while making the most of taxpayer money. I look forward to finding other opportunities to support DOE and NASA but also the research this Congress. And again, want to thank you uh, for working with us uh, to get this language added and encourage my colleagues to support the amendment. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. If there are no additional comments, we will move then to the next amendment and vote on the substitute later. The first amendment up uh, is from Mr. Foster, the gentleman from Illinois. You're recognized to oh, offer your you. amendment. Thank you. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number two. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3593 offered by Mr. Foster of Illinois. As unanimous consent to dispense with reading and without objection, so ordered. Uh, I recognize the gentleman now for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The Department of Energy's Office of Science has a particularly important role to play in our understanding of basic science and technology. As the co-chair of the National Laboratories Caucus, I look forward to resuming our bipartisan congressional delegation visits to all 17 of the DOE National Laboratories, which are truly the crown jewels of our scientific enterprise. With the new funding envisaged in this act, the programs that fall under the Office of Science and related agencies can begin to plan for big next generation product projects that will lay the groundwork for the advances of the future. In order to capitalize on this, these programs need to begin planning now on how they will utilize this expanded funding. The programs under the Office of Science undergo periodic interagency planning activities where they prioritize the projects that will shape the future of each program. These planning activities will frequently result in a roadmap or similar forward-looking document that incorporates the funding profile that the program expects to receive. Unfortunately, many of the planning activities undertaken in the last 10 years were taken under budgetary assumptions that we now hope were pessimistic. Now, for example, in the case of fusion, the recent roadmap was told to consider first a flat budget that barely kept up with inflation, 
Uh, secondly, a hopeful budget that was up only 2% per year after inflation, which is significantly less than we are hoping for now. And thirdly, an unconstrained budget where potential new product projects were listed and prioritized. But because this scenario was not then viewed as a realistic possibility, insufficient effort was put into generating detailed project cost estimates that will be needed to design the more robust programs that we're authorizing with this legislation. My amendment simply directs the DOE programs to create necessary roadmaps which assume a DOE funding profile compatible with the legislation that we're proposing here today. And as in my words to Secretary Granholm in her recent appearance before our committee to throw deep, uh, this more aggressive planning will allow these programs to really maximize the impact of these funds. Thank you. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back. Thank you very much. I have no request for discussion or additional time. So the vote occurs and on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment is offered by Ms. Moore, the lady from Wisconsin. You recognize for your amendment. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I have had the opportunity to get into the depth. will report the amendment. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Amendment number three, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3593 offered by Ms. Moore of Wisconsin. The clerk will dispense with the reading yes, with unanimous consent and Ms. Moore is recognized for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. My amendment uh, requires the Department of Energy's Office of Science to report interdisciplinary clean water and water shed research into the activities, both human and natural, that affect water availability and quality across our country, including in the fresh water environments like our Great Lakes. I would hope that uh, the committee would adopt this uh, very worthy amendment, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further discussion on this amendment? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say nay. Aye. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment is offered by, what is it? Maya. 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 Meyer, uh, the gentleman is recognized so for his amendment. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number four. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3593 offered by Mr. Meyer of Michigan ask, and Mr. McNerney. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So order. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Chairwoman and Johnson. This amendment establishes a research initiative within the Department of Energy's Biological and Environmental Research, or BER, program that is focused on using sophisticated next-generation technologies to advance the development of engineered ecosystems. Simply put, engineered ecosystems are natural environments with human-made elements incorporated into them. We live in these in our daily lives, our cities, farms, and parks, and even our interstate highway systems are all examples of engineered ecosystems. But the purpose of this amendment is to arm the Office of Sciences BER program with the ability to use emerging technologies to better improve these environmental outcomes. Leveraging innovative technologies like artificial intelligence and advanced sensing capabilities to solve complex environmental challenges can help us lead the fight against climate change. For example, AI can improve climate modeling and predict our most complex future environmental scenarios, informing potential for geoengineering uh, in order to reduce the amount of radiation entering and residing in the Earth's atmosphere. New sensors can also detect the presence of pollutants down to minuscule quality quantities, advancing bioremediation methods that use microbes to remove pollutants from water. It is not my intent to endorse a single technology or a single solution pathway, 
because to solve the complex problems associated with climate change, we must utilize any and all technologies at our disposal. That's why I'm offering this amendment. These are very early stage technologies that require more research to fully understand both their potential and their impact. If it helps our planet, it's worth our focus. And the process to find the best solutions can only be benefited by exploring technologies that seemed like science fiction just a decade ago. Engineered ecosystems and the adapting relationship between humans and nature will continue to play a critical role in our conversations around climate. Through technology, cities have buildings that are more efficient, farms have precision agriculture methods in order to reduce emissions. But through this amendment, we can seek to build off those success stories and create more with the utilization of these emerging technologies. I'll be the first to admit there is no silver bullet, but I'm willing to invest in DOE's path towards every technology that could play a role in an environmentally sound future. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and reserve the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Any further discussion on the amendment? Yes, Madam Speaker, I'd like to be recognized. Mr. McNerney from California. Mr. McNerney is recognized. Well, I thank the uh, chair for recognizing me. Um, and I wanna thank my colleague uh, from Michigan, uh, Mr. Meyer, for his leadership here on this issue. The United States has the highest level of investment in climate research and the greatest concentration of expertise of any individual nation. Because of this, we are uniquely positioned to research and assess atmospheric climate intervention through the application of these emerging technologies. Unfortunately, we're falling short when it comes to exploring all the possibilities despite possessing the highest concentration of capabilities to do so. I'm proud to co-sponsor this amendment offered by my colleague, uh, Mr. Meyer, uh, to establish within the biological and environmental research program an initiative aimed at bridging the gap. Uh, a simple authorization for the Office of Science to perform basic research on climate intervention would help put us at least on par with several countries and international bodies already taking these approaches seriously. China posts one of the largest atmospheric climate intervention research programs in the world, and the United Nations Scientific Assessment Panel voted to include the assessment of interventions to increase the reflectivity of the, in, the, in the stratosphere um, of the stratosphere in their ozone assessment report. Competitors and allies alike recognize the value of atmospheric climate intervention research. We must authorize the Department of Energy Office of Science to make the most out of research they already do on atmospheric systems. Applying these artificial, uh, this artificial intelligence technology, novel sensing capabilities, and other emerging technologies in such a program is a crucial step to ensure that the United States continues to be on the forefront of biological and environmental research. I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further requests for time? If there's no further discussion, the, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed aye. say no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the general lady from California, Ms. Laughlin. I think she's back. I am, Madam Chairman. You're recognized. Thank you. As you know, I do have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. I ask your unanimous consent that the uh, reading be dispensed with. And Madam Chair, I would like to note this amendment is really a wonderful um, suggestion. It would allow for the safer use of chemicals, industrial chemicals, uh, that would not be at odds with market needs. And we all know that we have a commitment to combating climate change. We have a concern for public health and responsible consumer behavior and all of that is pushing us towards a safer and more sustainable use of chemicals in manufacturing and consumer products. The use of supercomputing and artificial intelligence has the potential to transform our understanding of the adverse human and environmental effects associated with industrial chemical use. 
These technologies can be developed and applied to rapidly provide information to evaluate chemical safety to avoid the chronic diseases and environmental harm caused by toxic chemicals. They can also be used to develop alternatives uh, to substances that would pose a threat. This proposal would establish a supercomputing for safe, safer chemicals or super safe consortium that would allow EPA to leverage the computational assets at our national labs to expand on an existing work in this space and increase stakeholder participation by incorporating relevant state agencies. It would also work to address the inequitable burdens of environmental chemical exposures in disadvantaged communities and of potentially creating more hazardous chemical use in pro uh, products targeted towards those communities. Now, I mentioned that this was a wonderful amendment, but unfortunately it is not pertinent to this section of the bill because there is an existing center on computational toxicology and exposure, and this should be an amendment uh, in the EPA authorization. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent to withdraw this amendment. I wanted to raise it because of its importance and hope that we can pursue it in the appropriate space. Thank you very much. So the next amendment is by Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, you recognize. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number six, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3593 offered by Mr. McNerney of California. Uh, uh, um, sorry, we can dispense with the reading of the amendment. Uh, the chair now uh, recognizes the, the sponsor. Well, I thank the chair for recognizing me and for bringing uh, this amendment uh, up uh, for this consideration. Quantum research is one of those fields that will define which country leads in the scientific enterprise. This amendment would establish the Energy Sciences Network, ESNet, um, as a platform for the development and testing of quantum networking infrastructure. ESNet is a high performance computer network that provides highly reliable data transport capabilities for DOE researchers and external collaborators, which essentially makes this, it a system that circulates data between the involved parties and helps enable the DOE Office of Science mission. In addition to its operational functions, ESNet serves as a test bed for the development of new network technologies and has a skilled workforce of network scientists and engineers. As DOE's center of expertise in network operations and management, ESNet will serve as a critical component in the department's initiative in quantum networking R&D by serving as a platform for testing and ultimately delivering quantum networking to the national laboratories and other DOE sites. I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Any requests for time? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer. You're recognized to offer your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. I have an amendment uh, with the clerk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number seven, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3593 offered by Mr. Byer of Virginia. As unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. I'm introducing this amendment because it recognizes some significant recommendations in the recent National Academies report entitled, Bringing Fusion to the U.S. Grid. 
This amendment replaces language we enacted in the Energy Act of 2020 to direct the DOE to carry out fusion reactor system design activities with language more specific to the Academy's recommendations. And it establishes national teams to develop conceptual fusion pilot plant designs and technology roadmaps. You know, we all know that fusion energy has been 25 years away every year of our lives. Um, now it could be much, much closer, but there are specific technological objectives that have to be overcome. And the National Academy is, says, let's set up two teams to do this and we can make great progress. So this is a really important step in the effort to commercialize fusion energy. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. And I'm sure thank you and I yield back. Thank you. I think Mr. Lucas. Thank you. you have a Chairwoman Johnson. Time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Who strike the last word? Thank you, you Chairwoman like Johnson. Yes. I would like to thank Representative Byer for offering this amendment, which incorporates stakeholder feedback to expand upon the fusion energy sciences language in this legislation. The system design activities authorized in this amendment will strengthen the U.S. fusion industry and help prepare our energy sector for the day when commercial fusion power becomes a reality. This is a key piece of the puzzle in our mission to realize the full potential of fusion energy. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any other requests for time? Madam Chair, I would request the time, Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney. Uh, I thank the chairman for recognizing me. And I just wanna say uh, thanks for Don Beyer um, on this issue. He's led on fusion. We have a fusion caucus. Uh, this is an important issue. Uh, if we look to the future of energy in our, our nation, our world, fusion is going to have to be a big part of that. Uh, we need to pull out all the stops and move forward aggressively on that. So thank you again, Don, for your leadership. Uh, I urge all of my colleagues to be enthusiastic about fusion uh, and about this amendment, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further requests for time? If not, the vote, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is approved. Next, the next amendment on the roster is amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, and you recognize to offer your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number eight, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3593 offered by Mr. Foster of Illinois. As unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so offered order. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, this amendment is similar to one that I offered and uh, withdrew for the NSF earlier in this markup. Uh, the research performed at the DOE Office of Science often involves large scientific projects which, with multi-year construction and operating budgets. And as such, they are particularly vulnerable to unanticipated increases in inflation. When Congress authorizes a large construction project, uh, that commitment should be made in real inflation corrected terms. And our federal agencies should have some assurance that if inflation unexpectedly affects their planned budgeting, that they're not gonna be hauled back in front of Congress um, uh, for complaints that have more to do with macroeconomic conditions than their, their failure to produce. Um, so I understand that this is not, um, not allowed under our current authorization and appropriation procedures. So I withdraw my amendment and yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Uh, the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Walt. You recognize to offer the amendment. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, my amendment seeks to clarify the scope uh, of research. Oh. The amendment, the clerk will report the amendment. Oh, excuse me. I have an amendment at the desk. <laughs> Amendment number nine, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3593 offered by Mr. Waltz of Florida. Without objection, uh, the, we ask unanimous consent to um, 
This stands with the reading, and I now recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, my amendment seeks to clarify the scope of research within the Department of Energy's new emerging infectious disease program uh, without eliminating possible benefits of pathogen research. The amendment prohibits DOE's infectious disease program from conducting gain of function research with the potential to generate pathogens in humans. Uh, domestic gain of function research in humans is not intended for the Department of Energy and must be very closely monitored by health professionals. Gain of function research. Oh, I'm sorry. We muted. I mute. We tell me he's muted. I have. Somehow you're muted. Excuse me. Uh, gain of function <laughs> research, uh, Madam Chairwoman, is a topic of interest in the federal's federal government's 90-day review of the origins of COVID-19. In fact, this committee has jurisdiction over the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which historically has provided guidance to the federal research agencies on gain of function research. In 2014, uh, this office, OSTP, announced a government-wide pause and a risk assessment of gain-of-function research, and then subsequently, in January of 2017, OSTP and the White House provided guidance on the use of gain-of-function research. Uh, considering this history, Ranking Member Lucas and myself sent a letter on June 3rd seeking information about the White House Office of Science Technology Policy's role which is a cabinet level office in the 90 day uh, origins of COVID-19 investigation. It is essential for OSTP and the research agencies to provide their expertise and conduct full diligence during this review period. With this amendment, we are still enabling, this is important uh, uh, for my colleagues to understand, we are still enabling DOE's computing power to be applied to research on spread and severity of diseases that could be the cause of the next pandemic. However, it maintains thoughtful biosafety and biosecurity safeguards. I consider this a clarifying amendment by nature and I urge my colleagues to support it. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. I yield myself uh, five minutes. Uh, I support Mr. Walsh's amendment and thank him for working together on an appropriate definition for this limitation on DOE funding. Gain of function and loss of function studies are common in molecular microbiology and virology. The vast majority of gain of function research is performed to help understand how diseases work for the sake of protecting public health. The potential benefits of gain of function research are significant, but some of the specific types of studies are so, are so are at risk. Representative Walls has touched on an important issue in the national security and ethical implications of modern science. This committee should be a part of a larger conversation about how to balance the opportunities and the risk of the genomic engineering and how to ensure laboratory biosafety around the world. I look forward to working with Representative Walter and my colleagues on these important issues that I yield back. Mr. Lucas and CD. Any further, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank Ranking Member Walsh for offering this amendment, which provides a critical safeguard for DOE's emerging infectious disease research activities authorized in this legislation. Gain of function research that can increase the contagions or strength of a virus must be closely monitored. Until the American people have a better understanding of this work and its implications for national and global biosecurity, we have a responsibility to, live, to limit it here at home. I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any further requests for time? Did I, oh, did I hear someone? Okay. The vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 
The ayes have it and, and the amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. You recognize to offer your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 10. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 3593 offered by Mr. Posey of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so order. Uh, the, I recognize now the gentleman for five minutes to explain this amendment. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. <clears throat> uh, this amendment will ensure that none of the taxpayer funds authorized in HR 3593 will be used to uh, build up foreign countries' competitiveness in science and technology at the expense of our own. Specifically, uh, this amendment states that none of the funds authorized here can be used to award federal contracts, grants, loans, uh, to entities owned, controlled, or otherwise tied to a corporation based in a non-market economy, country, or foreign country of concern. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has made it an explicit goal to surpass the United States as the global frontrunner in the science and technologies. It's made in 2025 initiative, outlines a clear strategy to get ahead of us in critical technologies and industries of the future. Uh, simply put, we can't afford to spend the time, money, and effort to sow the seeds of new technologies here at home, while other countries like China get the same reward for no cost to them at all. We must do more to work together to protect American research while maintaining a spirit of open science that has fueled generations of discoveries. Uh, this amendment would also prohibit funds from going to entities listed under the uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2020. We have a moral obligation to ensure that none of the funds in this act benefit state-sponsored companies associated with human rights violations. The amendment provides common sense protections for taxpayer-funded research to ensure that we are not spending billions of dollars on research that China will then use to outcompete us. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I recognize myself to speak on this amendment. I want to thank Mr. Representative Posey for this amendment, which aims to ensure the responsible use of our limited research dollars at home and abroad. I am supporting this amendment uh, today, but with the caveat that we may need to revisit this language after the Department of Energy had had sufficient time to review its potential impacts on current and expected research activities. I look forward to continuing to work with Mr. Posey and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to make sure we strike the appropriate balance when we engage in well-intentioned collaborations with researchers and nations that are not always our friends. I thank you and yield back. Any, re any further requests for time? Madam Mr. Chair, Lucas. thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, and thank you, Mr. Posey, for offering this amendment. As Mr. Posey stated, the Chinese Communist Party has made no secret of their intention to do whatever they can to dominate the development of critical technologies. They're not above espionage, hacking, or illegal methods to acquire the knowledge and information they need. But we shouldn't make it easy for bad actors to reap the rewards of the United States investment. The underlying bill will result in significant investment in research and multiple projects in the most competitive science fields. This amendment would prevent companies owned or controlled by the Chinese Communist Party from receiving that information and opening the door to the theft of information. Additionally, this amendment takes a step further and makes sure that no company or entity has participated in atrocities against the Uyghur people receives funds from this bill. No company group, or individual who benefits from state-sponsored forced labor should benefit from the taxpayers of this country. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and the underlying bill and yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Is there any further request for time? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no.
The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. We will now vote on the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. Uh, the vote occurs on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All aye. those opposed say no. Further proceedings on this amendment then will... Oh, sorry. Well, believe it or not, we're ready to report the amendment. A reporting quorum being present, I move that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology report H.R. 3593 as amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill be approved. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table, and I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Members will have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplementary minority or additional views on the measure. I want to thank the members for coming to work this morning and getting this done. Uh, this concludes our marker and the meeting is adjourned.